Hi, everybody. Um, should Megan start in English and then I'm in Spanish or the other way around? Um, sure, I can start and I'll just give a little um, introduction. So we're going to read a part. It's hard to choose what part to read from this book because as many have noticed, it's quite long. Um, but this is a scene that readers of other of Mariana's books will possibly recognize a little bit because um, it's a haunted house. And it's a scene where three children have gone into a haunted house and one of them, whose name is Adela, becomes, she kind of gets sucked into the house and, and gets, um, almost hypnotized by it. So this is, this is the moment as they're going deeper into the house. Adela went ahead, excited and unafraid. She went further into the house that was lit by its own private sun, the house that was a different house inside. Pablo called to her to wait, wait, but she didn't listen. The vibration drew her onward. The light, which was not electric, or at least didn't come from any ceiling lamps, made her look golden. They followed her to the next room, which had furniture, dirty sofas, mustard colored, grayed by the dust. There were glass shelves stacked against the wall. They were spotlessly clean and held a lot of tiny ornaments. Adela went closer to see what they were. The shelves reached almost up to the ceiling. The lowest one held yellowish white objects, semicircular. Some were round, others sharper like claws. Gaspar went to touch one, but immediately snatched his hand away, disgusted. They're fingernails, he said. Vicky started to cry. Pablo and Adela kept looking. Gaspar watched them. They were acting strange, entranced, but as if they'd just woken up, still half asleep. Not like him and Vicky, who were alert. The feeling that something horrible was going to happen was very clear, at least for him, but he acquiesced, he went along. The house had sought them out and now it had them in its hands, in its claws. The second shelf was decorated with teeth, molars filled in with black lead. Then the canines, which he'd been taught in school were called cuspids, front incisors, tiny baby teeth, Gaspar guessed what was on the third shelf before he saw it. It was obvious. Eyelids, arranged like butterflies and just as delicate, with short eyelashes or long, dark ones, others with no eyelashes or at all. We have to collect them, said Adela, excited. Maybe there's something of my dad's. And we'll stop. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Megan. That was brilliant. You read very good. I'm not such a very good reader, but... I will try. And hello, everybody, for being there. And thank you for having us, all of us. OK. Adela se adelantaba, entusiasmada, sin miedo. Entraba en la casa iluminada por su sol privado, la casa que era otra por adentro. Pablo le pedía, espera, espera, pero ella no hacía caso. La vibración la atraía. La luz, que no era eléctrica, al menos no venía de ninguna Lámpara en el techo la hacía parecer dorada. La siguieron hasta la siguiente sala que tenía muebles, sillones sucios de color mostaza, agrisados por el polvo. Contra la pared se apilaban estantes de vidrio, estaban muy limpios y llenos de pequeños adornos. Adela se acercó para ver qué eran. Llegaban casi hasta el techo. En el estante inferior había objetos de un blanco amarillento con forma semicircular. Algunos eran redondeados, otros más puntiagudos. Gaspar se animó a tocar uno y lo soltó enseguida, asqueado. Son uñas, dijo. Vi que se puso a llorar. Adela y Pablo seguían mirando. Gaspar los observó. Estaban raros, fascinados, pero como si recién se despertaran, adormecidos. Él y Vicky no, ellos estaban alerta. La sensación de que algo horrible iba a pasar era clarísima, al menos para él, pero se entregó. La casa los había buscado y ahí los tenía, ahora, entre sus dedos, entre sus uñas. El segundo estante estaba decorado con dientes. Muelas con plomo negro en el centro, arregladas. Después los colmillos que le habían enseñado en el colegio se llamaban incisivos. Paletas, dientes de leche, pequeños. 
Gaspar adivinó lo que había en el tercer estante antes de verlo, era obvio. Había párpados, ubicados como mariposas, igual de delicados. Pestañas cortas, oscuras, largas, algunas sin pestañas. Hay que juntarlos, dijo Adela excitada. A lo mejor alguno es de mi papá. <laughs> All right, I guess that's Kelly and I's cue. Kelly and me, yeah. uh, I'm already starting <laughs> off terribly. <laughs> Uh, wonderful readings. Maybe I'll just ask the first question because I'll ask the obvious one. Kelly, That's how's that great. one? Um, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to add, you and I have talked a little bit about this, but I'm always curious, especially in a big novel like this that have so many interconnecting pieces and spans decades. You know, what was the start? What was the kernel? What was like the first idea that became, you know, our share of night? Uh, for me, I mean, I I operate sometimes with very simple and intuitive ideas. I'm not a writer or big, it can end in a big thing like this or it can end in a big idea, but I operate in very simple. And uh, I think the, 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 the word is desirable things I want to do. I want to do something. And for the longest time, I wanted to write a long novel and a horror novel. And uh, I was, writing a lot of short stories and uh, and a little uh, a, a smaller novel, a, a novel that is more like fantasy. It has, I mean, I call it fantasy and I think it's for teenagers, but my editor says like, hey, page two, there's a suicide. I say, oh, well, okay, like, you know, but anyway, and I really wanted the experience of a long novel, being obsessed, being years obsessed maybe, you know, being completely taken by the characters, making the characters, leaving the characters, you know, thinking how are they going to talk? And my first idea was an idea, very general idea. It was, this is, is this God, that is a very voracious, voracious God. This this order of, you know, black magicians kind of, that are very rich people and they're trying to, uh, conjure him and there's this guy that is the guy that they need to conjure the darkness that uh, up from the beginning it was kind of an amorphous god because I didn't want uh, you know too much description and I wanted to be a bit abstract in a way and that was the idea I started from that I, I started from you know the, the evil ones and, and what they were doing and then it started unfolding. Then it started unfolding that it was going to be very Argentinian. Then it started unfolding that it was going to be about the father and the son, that it was going to be about heritage, that it was going to be also about uh, these teenagers growing up. And it was going to be more in the realm of the occult that I thought at first, I thought at first more of a, really generous thing like uh you know and uh i remember reading uh, a short story by harlan ellison about uh you know the city um uh, being like uh the people living in the city being like a cult of killers that were sacrificing people to to a god that lives in the in the that they that they can see i can't remember some, something the cry of hungry a god box or something like that and it was very much in that kind of you know super uh order kind of sect idea and then when i was writing it it kind of became that that's what i love about novels i like short stories but to me short stories are very i have the idea i have the ending i have it's not that much of an adventure it's very i really like the result and the and but the being lost in a novel so that's why i decided that it was going to be in four parts because it it was in the doing in a way because i knew it was like too much to handle and uh i, I didn't want to do like a novel you know that starts and finish i didn't know it was going to be more than 700 pages 
Actually, in Spanish, it's 667. And some people think it's a joke. They think it's like, a, <laughs> oh, like yeah. it should be 666. And it's not. It's just what happened in the print. Because he has a devil on the cover. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, so um, and people are like, well, and I don't know. This is what happened. It's like very strange. Very strange. Uh, it's 588 in the British version and seven hundred something in the American. And it's very and it's very very long in the in 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 French. It's kind of moves. What's amazing about the translation that is kind of moves. It's kind of organic, mm -hmm. which I obviously like. I, I, I'll follow up on that. Um, I have loved your work since I first encountered it. Um, I love your collections. Uh, this book um, is the book uh, so far that I am most excited. I feel that I've been waiting for it to come out now for, for months. So other people would be, would be reading it. Um, but I did, I think when I started it, I, I felt almost a sense of jealousy or on behalf of your short stories, which I love so much. I thought I will feel guilty if I if I love the novel as much as I love the short <laughs> stories because I should, I should champion the, the shorter form. Um, and then I love the novel so much that I thought, well, what if I, I don't love the short stories as much as I used to, but I just read your story, um, My Sad Dead in the New Yorker and Again, I think I just love everything that you you do. That there's a there's a matter of fact warmth um, when you are writing a, about people, um, even when acts of terrible cruelty are are, are happening. That there's 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 a real warmth there um, that allows me uh, access. And I think that you write with great clarity about um, mystery with a capital M. Mm. Um, and I I guess, you know, I, I, I wondered if there was anything as you were writing this novel um, that that's that surprised you. Was was there anything um, I, I'm I'm struck by the idea that that you think of of um, that you think of when you work, you you are that you're doing something. Cause I I think about short stories the same way too, that there's something mm -hmm. that I want to do and the short story form is a way for me to try that. Um, yeah. And so I wondered, you know, how, how, long, how long did it take to write a book like this? And were there things about the act of writing it uh, which were surprising to you? It was about two years. And what surprised me was actually something that has to do with the short stories. The part that we read with, uh, with Megan, uh, it's from a short story that it's in Things We Lost in the Fire. The novel has two, four uh, parts. That's why it didn't take that long. To be, uh, two years is a lot, but I also work. I also, you know, I have, it's not that I dedicate myself only to writing. So. It's not that much. And uh, and also it was my my first novel of that ambition. So, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was, I don't know if it was, it was very fun, but it was a lot of work. But at one point, um, one of the things that I, I knew when I was writing was that houses were very important. There's the house of the order. There is a house in the middle of the jungle uh, in northern Argentina. There's this 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 house that we just read. There is the haunted house in the second part. Then there is like a very cheap house in Chelsea in the in the sixties in in London. And then there's a house that they are kind of building all the time that kind of mirrors the process of. Uh, becoming a man of Gaspar and also how broken he is in, at the same time. But in the second part, I was like, okay, I need a house that eats people, okay? And I need a house that has certain kind of characteristics and also that looks like a, the den of a serial killer or something like that, like a collector. 
by snow, but I needed that kind of appearance because the 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 house is like a mask. It's not really, it's not really a house. It's not the things that are there are not useful. It's just, you know, it's all a charade. Anything, uh, anyway, anyway. And when I was writing it, I said, "Oh my God!" But I wrote this house already, and it's in a short story. So I moved it. I moved the house from the story Adela's house to the novel. And since it was the early stages, I said, okay, I will bring the girl too. It's not the same character. It's the same mm -hmm. character in the sense that she looks the same. She doesn't have one arm and there's certain characteristics, but it's not the same character. It's not the same person. I kept the, the, the name and everything to, you know, when I realized I was doing this operation to, to keep the reference, but it's not that it's the same person. Or it's a multiverse, I don't know, but I mean, it's not the same. And and it opened the novel in such ways that I wasn't expecting it. Like the novel, I think, was less political at the, I don't think it's that political anyway, but it is like everything I I, I write, but it's um I, I had I think it has a lot of other influences apart from you know my my kind of uh, need to write about politics and and what happened in my country. But anyway, I brought the girl and the girl suddenly kind of broke the narrative. That story, the, the inclusion of that short story was like in, in the end, somehow the novel, it's amongst other things is about what really happened to her because in the in the short story you don't know in the short story she's just eaten by the house and then here is like 700 pages of explanation that what is going on <laughs> with this house and who is she and where she comes from so that really surprised me because i never revisit characters or and because I guess it's not my style. I think I get bored. I mean, there's a lot of writers that do it and they do it very successfully, but it's not something that I do. It's kind of to me, it's finished and it's finished, and I move on to to, to other things. And uh, that was surprising, and even more surprising was like the 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 you know the the power of the story itself of narrative. Like you, you bring a narrative that it's already you think closed into another, and then it explodes. It was like a, it was like an explosion in the in the novel, and I think it was an explosion for good, because there there is a lot of parts like the part of the journalist that is very, at at the end that is very linked with everything that is happening. Her mother that side of the, I mean, there's a lot of things that the trauma of Gaspar that was, he was always going to be traumatized with the kind of father that he has, but also he feels responsible for this girl. Even the ending, the ending is, uh, in, I'm not going to ruin it, but in the end, uh, he's looking for her. It's the girl that he, he, he took her there and he knows he's responsible somehow. So uh, she took it to the house and he didn't save her. So that she, her introduction made everyone more complex. And it was in an operation that I never do, that is taking a short story into another narrative. So I realized how connected is everything I do. That you, you people can say, but how do you don't know? Well, writers don't know that much, I think. You know, and uh, that was very surprising for me that, that 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 something so powerful could happen, I think. Thank wow. you. Mm. Uh, amazing answer. And I'm going to come back to like a different short story of yours, but I want to build off of Kelly's question for Megan. Um, you know, so Mariana was just talking about what was surprising in her experience. I wanted to ask Megan. You know, what surprised you having translated two of Mariana's collections before and now you've got this big doorstop novel <laughs> yeah, to tackle. I wonder if there was anything first just surprising from the story itself that and whether in the style that she told it or or 
other than obviously the length of the story, if, if there were other sort of challenges unique to doing a giant novel like this compared to uh, the short story collections? Well, I guess the short answer is that everything surprises me. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, and it was, for one thing, to uh, go back to what Mariano was talking about, I really do, like I was, I really loved the story of Della's house. And I loved um, to, I, I kind of like the idea that that's the set piece around which the whole novel turns, you know, like mm. it's the main um, mover of the whole um, conclusion of the book, the whole second half of the book. So, you know, the same way, it's, it's always nice to see little callbacks, you know, as, as any fan of horror movies knows. And in terms of what was challenging about the book, it's sheer size, you know, and keeping the whole, there were, the, it's, there are so many relationships. Mm so many storylines, so many timelines to keep straight. And, and I feel like it's a little more slippery for me, obviously, because I'm not a, I'm not the writer. And, but I still, I always wanna have the whole picture of the book in my head, the same way the writer does. But it's, it's, um, it's almost a futile, project because mm. I'm not Argentine. I have spent some a, a little time in Argentina, but I don't have those settings, like the the lush cell, um, jungle setting of the North or, you know, I don't have those sights and smells in my body. So, so when I want to orient myself in place and, and with Mariana, like the, the world building and the evocation of place is so important and and, and I'm always trying to feel myself in those places in order to be able to recreate them, which is a verb that I feel like we always use in, in when we talk about translation and it's really frustrating. But um, I think that, that this, I mean, this is the, by far the longest book that I've ever translated. And um, it was a challenge to kind of build that world. It's like building a mind palace in my head and then keeping it standing, you know? Um, keeping it standing for a lot longer than you do when you translate right. stories or short novels, which is what I usually do. So I feel like I, I probably got a little annoying with Mariana, like asking, because I, there really is, there's a lot of spatial, um, information in this novel and and like I and I, I found myself asking a lot of questions like what is this building like and what is this in relation to this and you know there's there's there was a lot of choreography that I felt like I needed to understand completely in order to be able to write it you know in 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 my own way amazing I um I wondered in the, you did, uh, Mariana, you did a, a wonderful um, Q&A with um, David Neyman, um, yeah. and you brought up the idea of, of psychogeography, and yeah. one, I think psychogeography is, is I think, a, a, a book, what you were talking about, a book sort of introduces a, a, a kind of psychogeography for the reader as, as they experience it. But I wonder if, if you could say a little bit about, about that term uh, for the people listening. Um, uh, yeah, it was kind of, uh, I was very taken by, by, by that. It's, I think it was a bit of a, uh, it was a bit trendy, I think. In the in the nineties, in in some part with many British writers like Ian Sinclair, uh, maybe John Harrison, a bit of Alan Moore, but basically the idea is that is the, the idea of the genius loss losses or Loki. I don't know how to say it in uh, in Latin, but it's the idea of that a place keeps memory. And if a place can keep 
the memory of what happened there. Let it be a house, a region, whatever, a country even. For me, it's a character because it has something, you know, that that it's imprinted in 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 it. So, for example, the the northeast of of Argentina that is the, the best the 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 best not the the first part of the of the novel maybe is the best too, but anyway, the first part of, of the novel to me was that region is a region that is associated for me with my childhood uh with a lot of mystery because it has a lot of uh its own mythology mythology is very haunt which is kind of uh, a characteristic that to me is very associated for example with american southern gothic i remember reading the the novels of william Faulkner being hot not because they were difficult or long but because it's hot in the novels and uh um it's a it's poor but but people are kind of very um i don't know they have fun in in, in a way it's not that kind of i mean it's, it, I, i'm i'm not saying that they're happy poor people but I, what i'm saying is that they have something in relation to their beliefs to their music to that makes it very lively that it is not a very, it's not a sad place at all. It's a very intense place. So it's a character. And uh, what happened there before? Well, there were a lot of uh, indigenous people that unlike the rest of the country, they weren't massacred. And they were massacred only because they, they sent Jesuits there and the Jesuits wanted more to, you know, to convert the people other than kill them. Also, because of the characteristics of the region, it was not a region that was very, well, now, now it would be today, but those days it was not a region that was very, you know, useful for agriculture, for example. So, you know, and um, it was not needed to exterminate the, the, the people that were living there. So to me, of, of course there were, of course, they suffer a lot, and they were used as servants and 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 everything. But they could keep their religion. It's near Brazil that has a completely different religion in the Afro-Brazilian. I mean, this whole thing, the memory of this place, of all the syncretism of this place, makes it a character. And uh, when you come to Buenos Aires, it's completely different. It's the immigrants. It's the port, it's the, and even in the in the certain barrios, what the memory that the place have here and the, somehow the story that it can't help repeating because of that, because as we have memories, we have traumas and we have things that we can't really uh, get rid of. To me, that's the, 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 the idea of psychogeography. It's basically a place that has, a psyche <laughs> so to me that makes it a character and I was very taken by that because the well every country has a history but uh in in Latin America is very you know the the colonial process in, in in Latin America is still very much alive because as in America we are young countries so it's that it's very it's very much alive and it's very much present in in a in a way so and and Argentina is such a big country that also it has a lot of characters a lot of you know different histories in in different places so um I was very taken by that and that's how I've been treating the short stories and the novel too with place being a, uh, another character that also influences the, and shapes the characters that that live in it but basically it was by reading about London which is something that I do a lot like that cross you know like I, I read something in in a in the British or American writers I love and I think okay how would this work in my environment in my history in my place and um that's the mix I, I work for. And when I started, you know, 
researching for the psychogeography of Argentina, it was amazing. It's very dark, so it was very useful. <laughs> Ah, um, yeah, thank you. I, I want to sort of build off of that. And I'm going to sort of say up front, this is probably not a question. It's probably more like, wow, this is really cool. Can you respond to this? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but similar to Kelly, I was going to mention what, the first short story of yours I ever read was The Dirty Kid. And it was, you know, for me, one of those special reader moments was like, oh, I'm going to read everything this person ever publishes. Um, and, and today, after reading a few things, including this online thing uh, from the New York Times, I'm going to reference I really started thinking about the dirty kid and and your novel because I think there's some really interesting similarities in how violence and horror, the real world violence and the horror of the stories sort of fit. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. sorry for the ramble, but uh, you had this great quote in the Times today, and it was in reference to the violence in Latin America being normalized. Um, mm -hmm. And you said putting in the horror, including the jump scares, including the gore, including the parts that have to do with thoughts about evil, it's like returning those things to the realm of the horrible. Rather than rather than the quotidian to which we grow accustomed, and for a moment I was like, of course, but also like, you know, I'm I'm so, you know, someone who writes horror frequently, we usually get uh, I don't know, Kelly if you get this too, you usually have to explain why you write horror. Isn't there enough bad things in the world that sort of assumed that horror writers are 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 doing the job of desensing desensitizing people to violence? Where you as you're you're stating almost here as the goals that you are. Um, you know, you're trying to open people's eyes to know the real violence and, and, and comparing it that way. So again, I don't think it's a question. It's more, that's really cool. Do you anything you want to add to that or expand on? Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, we are, I think we are asked all the time why we, we write horror in two ways. One way is why do you waste your life you know, <laughs> taking this um, very minor kind of genre instead of going to the big literature and, and stuff. To me, it was always the opposite. And also in the way of that, why if there's so much horror in this world, we need you are dwelling in it, like some kind of exploitation of it. And I think there's a lot of horror in the world, yeah, but I don't think people are so um, affected by it really. I, I really I really don't think so. I every time I see like a mass shooting in America, what I see is uh well the people that are the victims very moved, but then there's a shooting the next week and then it's like mm -hmm. let's pray for the people and that's kind of it's kind of so normalized and it's this chill is I mean it's children going to school with guns. This is like absolutely amazing to me also because mm -hmm. we have other kinds of violence. And um, and also you talk, I remember once I was in Monterrey in Mexico and uh, I was going to the to the university there to talk some, I, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, the guy that was uh, taking me there was a young boy, like, I don't know, 19, 20. And he was telling me, this is, you know, the, the mountain that Monterrey is like King Mountain or something like that. So this is the mountain that gives the name to the place. This is, you know, this barrio, this another barrio. And then he says to me, like a tourist location, oh, and this is where the head of the blogger girl appeared. And I was like, wait a second, what blogger girl, what head? What are we talking here? And, she, and he told me, yeah, there was a blogger girl that was blogging about the Zetas, that is a narco group, narco gang, and uh, something the Zetas didn't like, and they killed her. And uh, they kept, or, or I don't know what they did with the body, but they threw the head on the side of the road. And I, I'm, ama I'm amazed even myself at how des desensitized I am myself to these kind of things, because what I asked him was, and how did you know that it was the, do you know how it was, how did you people know that it was the head of the blogger girl? Like it could be any head. And he says to me, oh, because they left the keyboard. And it was like, oh, okay. So obviously it has to be the block. <laughs> and then we went, you know, to the, and I had a nice dinner. And that mini exchange that I put as an example, to me is uh, the, the way we deal with violence really. 
like there's a lot in in many things that that we do there's a lot of pretense and there's a lot of if, if i think even more now that we are like more public because of social media and stuff so we are all the time like horrified by this so this is so awful this is so terrible but it's i mean we are going on in in our lives and nothing is really changing and we have the phone here and the phone has parts that are you know taken from a pit in Congo by a child that is going to to die very young or be in a gang when he's 18 and probably die at 19. And we we still have the phone. But I, I think what I mean is this. We won't get rid of the phone because of this, because we you, you can't empathize all the time with everything. And you can't be so near the horror that happens every day to empathize with it and be absolutely demolished by it every day because that's not how your psyche works. And there has been awful things all the time. So the only thing you can do is getting used to it. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying that people are getting used to it because people are evil or awful. This is the only way you can deal with these kind of things. But to me, if a horror writer has, or a horror director or, or, or whatever has, uh, you know, something useful to give to people, is telling people again, look, this is awful. Like, really, this is awful. And you can think about it here together because we are in a safe, safe space. We are reading a book. We are watching a movie. Nothing will harm us here. We are going to be scared for a while and maybe we have a little nightmare, but nothing will happen. We take a glass of water in the middle of the night and that's it. But remember how it feels for people that have to go through these situations. And uh, to me, it's not, I'm not talking about like moral responsibility or, or anything like that, but that's what attracts me to the genre that you have this safe space where you can feel this really intense things that happen in reality because horror it can not be supernatural it can be like a re very realist realistic too and um and uh, recreate it and can think about it without the you know the need to be correct about it and say oh man, i'm so sorry or this i'm so awful this is so awful and it's all very hypocritical to me but not in a bad way. I mean, this it is nothing else we can do. But horror can get you back to how you are supposed to feel, I think, and uh, and how it's impossible to feel with this level of violence. So I don't really think. I think it's a very bad. In Spanish, it's called mala leche. That is kind of a very uh, they they say that to horror writers with very bad intention, like uh, you know, mm -hmm. why do we need more horror? Like uh, we and it's like a very it has a moral superiority that I really can't stand. It's like and and what do you, and what are you doing about all the horror? Like you can't watch it. I am so horrified. You kill children. I don't kill children. The world kills, kills children. I just write about it. So, you know, to me, it's kind of, um, I even get mad, as you can see. But I, I, I really get, you know, uh, it really puts me in, in a bad mood when, when gender writers in general have to explain why we use imagination, why we use horror, why we like uh, sci-fi, why we like marvelous things, why, because, um, I really resent the, you know, the kind of grayness of uh, trying to imitate reality and that being the legitimate thing. Like, why is that the, the legitimate thing? And uh, I found in genre and in poetry too, more truth than in in a more, I found the writers a bit more um, brave in a way, also because they know they're going to be put down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> every time I think that Ray Bradbury didn't even want, win the Pulitzer, every, everybody wins the Pulitzer, like, you know? And 
this man is a genius and they didn't even even give him that but they give it to you know they don't want to be mean but i mean and yeah so that that kind of and that, that that's a man that you know talking about his childhood in another decade and in another country made me feel nostalgic about my childhood and that's mm. how does he do that he was a magician and uh why is that despised you know i so i really uh, I, I i really don't like it when they ask me for explanations and when it comes from a moral superiority thing i just get really mad also mm. And I I should say um, I there are some questions uh, popping up in the Q and A and we will get to those uh, very shortly. But if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I I feel that 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 question never the question of why people write hard never quite goes away, yeah. and it is a very irritating question. But all of the things that you just said are extremely interesting. Yeah um so i i don't i don't always mind that the question has been asked because the things that people say in response are often so interesting um you said and i agree with you that that i i love i love horror and i love genre in general because uh it it one of the things that it does is it 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 allows for an emotion uh, mm -hmm. a, an emotion as a response to to what we're engaging with um and I, I absolutely have that when I read your work. I have a, a slightly, I guess, oddball question um, that I, I feel as if in the last couple of years that there has been, I love her, there's been an, an enormous amount of, of wonderful books which use her as a technique or are firmly in the, using the conventions of her. Um, but I think that there there are different kinds of horror, and and this to me is is, you know, it's it's a great gothic, and it has, um, you know, the parts of the book are set in the sixties and seventies, and I feel that the 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 thematic material and and your approach to the work, um, sort of draws on the tradition of the sixties and the seventies, sort of the 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 gothic, the idea of of ritual magic, that these are things that I feel I didn't see very often in books, but they seem to be sort of burgeoning up again. And the thing about that that, that I am both interested and troubled by is that um, I see a connection in that to some of the right-wing conspiracy ideas here in the US, the idea that there are uh, secret cabals of the elite who perform terrible satanic rituals and uh, eat children. Um, and I, you know, when I read it in a book like this, I, I feel as if that metaphor is very powerful for me, but I also think, am I drawn to this kind of story in the same way that QAnon um, adherents are drawn to conspiracy the theories? You know, yeah. is there some general sense of unease right now that is, yeah, I understand. The thing is that, like the Q and on and all on all the on all those things, I don't think people know a lot about them here, and it's kind of even I was quite surprised about knowing some things like they really believe that, and um, and I think I was thinking more in the in the way that um the rich in my uh in, in my continent let's say have been always linked to dictatorships linked to you know linked to um genocides of the of the original people and it's more like um you know, it's 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 not a uh, it's it's not a conspiracy at all, but it's more like a metaphor of what and how they behaved and how they shaped this continent that is so absolutely um, 
uh, you know, it's the, the inequality is absolutely unbearable. Like uh, uh, Megan lived a lot in Chile and she can, uh, Chile is even more, they have even more inequality than Argentina. And it's like you're the very, very rich and the very, very poor. And there's certainly the class, but it's not very big. And so I was thinking that and the impunity of that because they are very impune. They, they, nothing ever happens to them. But I was never thinking about the, this the kind of conspiracy theories. That said, it's interesting to me that in, in other countries that have another problems and things like that, uh, another, you know, kind of, it's like an urban legend in a way, QAnon and all that kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't have a problem reading in that way. I, I like to do things like that to, to kind of, you know, open the conversation and saying, you know, that it where I come from, that doesn't exist. And it's very weird. <laughs> like, what? And uh, so, like, in the... In the novel, it would be very literal. Like what I what I do in the novel is, you know, do, take like this uh, upper class people and make them do things as as a metaphor of what they do in uh, in 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 real in reality. But I don't think anybody thinks that a rich, very rich person in in Latin America eats anything mm. apart from very good food, mm. but. It's interesting that, and I it doesn't bother me because that's kind of horrific too. That somehow the things went so wild and so crazy that there's people believing that, mm. and um, and you know, I, I, it comes from from the sixties, from Golden Dawn, from Aleister Crowley, from rock and roll, from Kenneth Anger, from you know, that kind of. Uh, that, that 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 kind of Aquarius uh, gone bad ends in the Beatles and in Charles Manson kind of idea. But you know, if it resonates with other contemporary things, even if it was not my idea, I like it because I think horror is also a very contemporary genre, and somehow puts the finger in things that are in the air somehow. I don't, it's very weird what happens. And I think it's part of, you know, what the appeal is is for me. Uh, so, I'm, I, I mean, it would be a shame if someone that believes in that reads it and say, yeah, you see, you see, you see. But if someone reads it and, 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 and finds it a bit parody of that, for example, to me is, is, is interesting. That's what happens with translation in a, in a bigger way than just translating that. That's, that's very interesting too, to me because the translation doesn't end in translating everything, but it also comes with, you know, with all these kind of uh, cultural things that are read in a different way, in, in different, uh, situations and even in different eras, because I I truly believe that QAnon and all that thing in ten years people will forget about it, like right? mm. really. And uh, you know, but it's interesting that somehow it channeled that in in a weird way without me knowing about it at all. I think. Thank you. Yeah. We, um, let's move over to the Q and A. Yeah. I, I just had one quick question for Megan that sort of builds into one Q and A. So I'll sort of like okay. do do both into one. Um, Megan, you mentioned going back and forth with Mariana. Like I was I was curious like how collaborative things got, but like more specifically to something, you know, as I'm rereading the book in the beginning, um, you know, Mariana, the author talks about, and, and I am not a Spanish speaker, so if I butcher the pronunciations, please forgive me. A parciado is ghost and Desaparciado is disappeared, and, you know. And within you know the English text that I'm reading, it it calls attention to those differences in word. And there's also like another section where Murray or you use the word haunts, and you know both both of you as the writers mentioned, there's no 
there's no like one-to-one -one Spanish translation. So I guess I was using those as an example as like how much collaboration uh, over, especially over like particular phrases, because Paige Lewis was asking a similar thing about if there was a particular phrase that you had, had to work on or thought about about uh, quite a bit. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they're infinite. Um, yeah. I, so one thing that was um, a little, a little interesting is, is you know, there, there are these characters uh, the upper levels, the upper members of the order who speak both in English and Spanish. You know, they inter intersperse mm. Spanish and English. So I so I made the decision to keep it and to keep those words in in italics, the words that are in English, to kind of indicate when they're going back and forth between mm. between English and Spanish. I think that's well, I can't remember exactly when when they talk about there's no word in Spanish for haunt. But um, in terms of uh, things that we went back and forth on, there's uh, one one thing that I have so much trouble with in translation is soccer, <laughs> soccer terminology. And you maybe not didn't even notice this, but mm. there's a lot of talk about soccer in this book. I don't know how to talk about soccer either in English or in Spanish. Like I literally do not know. And I went back and forth. I had British friends and American friends because you know, and they talk about it differently in the UK than they do in English right. or in, in, the, in America. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time on that. Hmm. Um, I also spent a lot of time on, well, the the section um the short se section that's narrated kind of all in one sentence by the doctor was something that i spent a lot of time on not just because of the medical terminology but in order to get the voice right because it is this kind of guy who's in the throes of death and he's de de um, delirious and you know he's jumping around in different points in his memory and um to me, it was really important to to get that um, precise to get that voice kind of precisely right. Um, and then towards the end, when you, we have Gaspar is a little more grown up, and Pablo, his friend, who is who is gay, we get into a little bit of the the gay kind of subcultures, and there were a lot of words that to me seemed very specific. And there are words that Pablo uses to, to talk about, um, he has a, a, a taxonomy. So he would talk about, there's a, a word chongo that's used a lot that I really had to go back and forth about how to, to translate. And I think I translated it five different ways. And um, there's was, there was a word valijeros, which, means a person who goes to a gay cinema of porn and he's coming from an office and he's carrying a suitcase. Valija is a, is a suitcase and, and he sits there and keeps the suitcase or the briefcase on his lap while he's watching. And it seems so specific to me. And you know, I have no, I, I, there's, we don't have a word for that. And, and, you know, I went back and, and I would watch, I would read some books from, from that time or watch a movie from that time. Um, and the other example that comes to mind is there's a phrase that for up until the very end I had in, I was keeping in Spanish, which was um, te tiran muertos en Argentina. And, that, and ultimately, you know, nobody's going to understand that. And I translated it as they toss bodies at you. This is what they do in Argentina. They toss bodies at you. And it, and it talks about the, you know, the dictatorship. And, and when they want to scare you, they'll, they'll, throw, they'll toss a body at you. And I was never very, well, I shouldn't say this, but I was very unsure about, you know, translating it that way, which is, you know, we don't we don't have that that phrase or that that expression, 
Um, and it's been really interesting to see how people react to it because a lot of people have pulled that line out, um, which I think is really interesting because on one hand, it's, um, you know, it's not a saying in English, but it really, but it does make you sit up and take notice. It's like, oh, right. this is a weird way of saying this. So I think ultimately, even though it's not, you know, it's not familiar, I think it's effective in getting people to, to pay attention to it. Um, there are a lot of other examples I can go into, but we are short on time. We, yeah, I think we Soccer, should... I can imagine. I can even say soccer. Like, uh, I know it's, I know you say soccer, but to me, it's kind of a scandal. <laughs> Football. <laughs> I learned that it was, it was, the word soccer comes from British English. Do you know yeah. that? But it's yeah. football and we are world champions. So, I mean, yeah. yes, I, I say both. I go back and forth. It depends on who I'm talking to. Yeah, I will weird brag and say I enjoyed very much sending uh, Mariana WhatsApp messages <laughs> during Argentina's run because yeah. sometimes she was in Australia were watching the game on like an hour of sleep at like yeah. three in the morning or something. Yeah. <laughs> He was having lots of fun watching the, the games. And I was like, literally, I, I received the, the message and I was like dying, <laughs> dying. <laughs> like thinking maybe we should call an ambulance because I'm really in a state of yeah. absolute, you know, insanity. And I'm not a soccer but it was the best, it's the, it's the best, <laughs> greatest soccer game ever. <laughs> I, I haven't seen it again. I have I I, I should I, I I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have some really good questions and maybe some of them we should try and, and do sure. quickly. Okay. Um and I think the simplest one to do quickly is I'm gonna combine two. There's a question, Mariana, about um if there were books that were influences on our share of night. And I guess I'll combine that. Um there are a couple of questions asking. Uh, either for recommendations of horror or books that you are currently reading that you would recommend. Um, I, the, this may, well, the, the, there's many, but there's um, in the first part, there's one very obvious that is called Mac McCarthy's The Road, but also a book that people don't mention that much. And it's to me, it's very, Oh, everybody's going to realize this. It's Firestarter by Stephen King, which is also a girl on the run, a little girl with his father that is sick and dying. It's you know, and um, and then in the other parts where obviously I read a lot of sixties novels, as you said, Kelly, like um and many London 60s novels like Colin Wilson, like writers nobody reads anymore. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of uh, very Soho kind of of thing. And in more contemporary, I, I read a lot of, uh, well, I, I think I reread read the whole um, saga of John Constantine, Hellblazer. I love I love comic books, so um, I think I reread that. And then there were a lot of influences that were not necessarily literature, but it was a lot of um, art, for example, like the 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 other side that is the place where they go with the whole um, bones and stuff that of course many people i love cemeteries and and, every, and you know and, and i love places with bones and everything but it's not like a like a mass grave metaphor it was basically something i took from a writer that i like a lot that is called alfred kubin that is, so was also um uh uh an illustrator and it's kind of very spooky what he did because you can see in many of his images, they are all pre Second Guerra, Second World War, and you, they are kind of predictive of that, of the of those images of that kind of horror. I think I, I, uh, he was amazing. And what I'm reading now, I'm writing. So when I'm writing, I don't read that much um, narrative. But because I don't have the time, it, it's not because they influence me and I go crazy. So what I'm reading basically is um, poetry. 
Stevie Smith. I love her and it's right here. I love her. And uh, and since I'm one of the novels I'm writing, it has goats. I'm reading this book that is kind of very good and I really recommend it to you. It's called The Dar Darkened Room that is about spiritualism in Victorian England and the power of women in Victorian England and how they could, you know, have something. And I'm reading a lot of um, psychology. So I'm reading R.D. Lang or again, uh, something happened with the color again. And uh, yeah. I'm reading R.D. Lang that it's kind of um, very strange psychologist, also British. And um, I'm reading also normal ones because I'm, I'm dealing a bit with mental health. And I don't want only experience, but I want to read something. So I'm not reading a lot of narrative because I'm kind of in the face of investigation and uh, and kind of to me poetry is like music so i'm kind of you know letting mm. words that not necessarily have you know a uh, plot but that they come from from a different place but uh yeah i you know sometimes i read a, a short story here and there the last uh, horror writer that i really like and i i would like to recommend is a, a hungarian guy that's called attila veres it's published in English. The book is called The Black Maybe. And it's uh, absolutely terrifying. And it's uh, very different. Also, we don't read, I think, in general, that much poetry from Eastern Europe, that much literature from Eastern Europe, <clears throat> even less gender from Eastern Europe. And I think the guy has something going on there. Yeah. He's is, uh, the title, sorry to interrupt, was The Black Maybe? A few people The Black wanted. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's I'm called Attila, to... like Attila, like Attila the Hun. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think that I wonder uh, if that's. I think I know the publisher. I've, I, I will look for that. Um, there's a question from Dean Russell that that came in very early, addressed uh, to both of both of y'all, Paul and Mariana. Um, you've both included queer characters in your work whose experience rings true as a queer person, I would love to hear um, how you decided to include queer characters and how you authentically realized their experiences. Uh, I'll say, I guess, really yeah. quickly first. Uh, well, thank you, Dean, I'm, I'm honored. Um, so in the case of The Cabin at the End of the World, um, I started from like a very personal place, like, or not even selfish, but like, this was gonna be my seventh novel and that felt like a big, big deal to me. And I started thinking back, you know, how I got to that point of writing a seventh novel. Um, my first readers, besides my wife, Lisa, um, but my, uh, I would say even more consistent than my wife, Lisa, because she quickly got sick of all the horrible things happening to children <laughs> when we had two young ones. Um, but uh, I'm very lucky to have a very close extended family. And my cousin, Michael, who's really like an older brother, he's 10 years older. Uh, my cousin, Michael, and his husband, Rob. Um, and then my aunt, Mary, who's like a second mom, and her her wife, Debbie, were my first readers from like the very start, like when I wrote terrible, awful stuff. And some of my favorite memories are of those early writing days where I, we would go to Michael and Rob's place in Brookline and play dice games. And then we would stop and they would pull out my stories. And, you know, they were for me, they were the best kind of first readers because they were supportive, but they weren't afraid to tell me what they thought did and didn't work. So when it came to Cabin, I was like, you know, I really want to try to honor um, I really want to try to honor Michael and, and Mary in particular in, in the relationships that I had the privilege of observing up close for decades. Um, and with that book, I only had one first reader and it was Michael that I brought back. Um, it was funny. He was telling me the other night on the phone. I was like, geez, you know, I read the draft, but I, I never, you know, this, the draft you sent me, but I haven't read the, you know, the full book, which he's, you know, he's seen the movie. So he's going to do that too. Well, thanks for that. To me, it was, it was really very normal because my life, I mean, throughout my life, I've been my friends, my world, the things, even the things I, I find writers I like, um, 
even things that I find erotic has a, a, a lot to do um, with, with queer lives and queer people. So kind of, I, I don't know, my first boyfriend is gay. I use him a lot as, you know, I basically, I, I write a scene and I kind of show it to him and, and ask him, does it work? Like, this is possible? And also, if I want it to be hot, it's like, is it hot? <laughs> and I remember when I wrote my first novel that has two uh, gay characters and uh, as protagonists, I did, I was 17, I didn't know anything. I barely, I had sex already, but you know, I was in that experience. And I watched a lot of porn, I remember. And I was reading a lot of gay writers, especially French, like Cyril Collard and Hervé Guibert. It was also very mixed with the AIDS pandemic at, at the time. So and there was a lot of uh, uh, literature about, about that. And uh, there was a mix with, uh, you know, with the uh, illness and pleasure that I think kind of took my imagination forever. My friends are gay, my, I don't know, my mother is gay. I mean, it's really, to me, it's like a non-brainer. To me, it's like they are there because they are there, you know? To me, it's not an agenda thing. It's not, I never think about it the, in a way that I have to put it, you know? I mean, it's like absolutely um, normal. And it, in fact, it, kind of makes me um, uneasy in, in, in a way uh, as, a, as a writer for it to be like a thing now. It's like, I thought we were past that. I thought we were past that in the nineties, for example, like it was like, you know, um, you know, people with a different, no, no, we different pe pe people that have you know any kind of sexuality are sexuality. I don't think it defines you that that, that much, and um, I, I, you know it's very important, but it doesn't define you completely as a person. So um, to me, it was very, and also I had uh, the novel is dark, you know, and I wanted some kind of, even for me, some kind of part that it was fun, that it was sexy, that it was, you know, that I could have some kind of, you know, having fun with them, you know? They are attractive people, some of them. So, you know, it was kind of making a movie, when, you know, so, and, and, and putting things that, that I find very attractive too. So to me, it was like very, and I've been doing it since the beginning without, without thinking about it in terms of, you know, uh, to, to me, uh, there's no, uh, uh, I, I know there, there are different challenges and, 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 and everything when you are not in the norm, but, but to me, we, it's, it's that, it's my life. It's, you know. It's what I know. So to me, it was a uh, uh, very interesting. And also, you know, sexuality is very, I'm not going to get too personal because I, I, I'm not, but it's, um, yeah, m m m most of the time I'm heterosexual. That doesn't mean that I haven't, you know, you, know, you, you can, I mean, Something comes from movies, something comes from friends, something comes from myself. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, yeah. And also it's like, it, it's, I think basically sometimes it's a, a way of doing that, you know, of being like a bit relaxed and say, oh, let's, these bodies are having such, you know, kind of heavy, things happening to them to have some fun to have some you know to get some kind of relief and uh yeah and take some kind of also pressure in this thing that we are all nervous about talking sex and gender and you know 
and it's kind of okay let's you know let, let, let them play it was playful to me I'm, I, I, I know that we're going to run out of time eventually. Um, Megan, there's some questions for you in the, the Q&A that I think you could probably just type in some answers and then everyone could see them um, about, uh, about untranslated work and some other things that I think are fairly simple, simple things to answer. Um, there's a question here that might be fun. Um, which is addressed to everyone. Um, what is the most interesting or strange thing you have had to research for any of your books? <laughs> uh, I'm laughing, I'll say briefly, because it was the most sort of like uncomfortable email I ever sent, but at the same time, I was sort of like evilly laughing. But uh, my my two kids had the same pediatrician, same doctor. Um, when I was writing Survivor Song, there's a <laughs> there was a question I needed answered. I don't want to say what that question was. Uh, but it involved like some uh, surgery. <laughs> and so I asked him as a pediatrician in an email, like, hey, uh, did, would you be able to basically perform a certain roadside surgery? You know, would you have been, ex uh, would you have been exposed to it? And I was a little nervous when I sent that email, but he loved answering it. It's pretty funny. So I don't know if that's strange, but that was, that was one that made me laugh. <laughs> and for you, Kelly, what was the weirdest thing? You know, at the moment, I'm I'm um, starting to think about a a ghost a ghost story, a very short novel, um, which will be set in upstate New York, and so I have been researching upstate New York, just in small towns, large abandoned houses, um, and that has been enormously uh, pleasurable and and strange too, because once you begin looking at big old abandoned houses um they all they all have stories stay away from langan's house yes <laughs> i wrote a story that it's in the in which one is it in the dangers of smoking in bed that is about a woman that is obsessed with uh heartbeats mm. and I had the idea of, you know, like a Cronenberg kind of thing, like a twisted uh, kind of fetishist kind of thing that she's, a, um, a, you know, she's a kind of uh, excited by certain organs that are not the usual organs. So I chose the heart because of the meaning of, of the heart and, and, and everything. And, you know, I then I guess I took it to Juan too, that is something that I realized very late. But uh, at one point I thought, well, there's all kinds of things in the internet. Would there be fetishes that, you know, have their, and they are. And it's, um, it's a very big community. There's YouTube videos, they have a website, it's open to everybody. It's very strange. And basically it's them, they film them themselves with a stethoscope and you can hear the sounds and they leave messages like, oh, that was so hot. It's like, these people are very, very, very complicated. And, you know, and that, that was the weirdest thing because I had to spend a lot of time there lurking, you know, like a crazy person. And uh, and I was embarrassed in a way, like I, I didn't want anybody to, you know, enter my room and watch me <laughs> watching these things because it was like, it was even more, it was weird because it was more embarrassing than watching porn. Like porn, you can explain, you know, it's sex. But this is what, what, what is this? And yes, they're, you know, I invite you to Google it. They're very easy to find too. It's, they're right there in in the open and at, uh, when i started researching let's say this they were kind of you know it's soothing whatever but then there's some of them that are very hardcore and not, not soothing at all so that was weird there's a, a question here um about um uh, from from 
Kimberly, who teaches a writing class and they're discussing uh, story beginnings. And so it's a question about what what you do. Is there, when you're writing, when you're beginning a story, are you thinking about how to pull readers in uh, quickly and wholly into the story? Is, you know, is how do you approach an opening of a story? For me, and it's a very short, the answer is all about the voice. And um, uh, yeah, I understand the importance of a good first line, but I think it, to me, it's more important how it that first line it said, who is the, the you know, who, 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 is, who is telling this story. And mm -hmm. uh, to, to me is that I'm not very obsessive with, you know, engaging and first lines. I'm a very, I think I'm a very introspective writer. Like I really like the connection with readers and I really like have talk with readers and stuff. But when I write, I'm in a different place. I'm not thinking about pulling anyone in or, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not writing for anybody else. I think than myself and you know the, the creatures in my head. I I think about I think about voice and, and tonal quality and I I think about honestly what I am trying to find is an entry point into a story for myself, which I don't have until I have a sentence that feels tonally and the voice is right that it feels as if there's a question there or sort of line a line that I can I can pursue and then you know that it's often the same with the next couple of sentences as well that it is a a a, a path that I am I am creating for myself uh and hopefully then as a path for someone else as well but it's about interesting myself and in what's happening in the story and about finding 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 the right door. Yeah. Great answers. I'll pretend both of them are my answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I will say like I, I have spent, particularly for stories, and sometimes with novels, like an entire writing day or two just rewriting the first like two or three paragraphs until I feel like, okay, that has to be set before I can go forward. Even if I have like a general idea of, oh, I know what the event of the beginning is supposed to be. But as you both said, finding the voice is very important. Um, well, I'll be the math teacher and say we're, we're approaching an hour and 25 minutes. Maybe, uh, yeah. maybe it's probably time to call this as much as we could go on for hours and hours. Yeah. I don't know if uh, Pierce is going to come back or not. <laughs> I am. I'm here. Oh my gosh. I could listen for days, not hours. I could listen to the four of you for days. Thank you everyone so much for your questions. We're sorry to not get to them, um, but I just love the way that everyone is so engaged with this work, engaged with Mariana's books and Megan's just flawless translations. And thank you everyone. Yes, so we have, yes, yeah, thank you, Paul. We have the book. <laughs> it, it is officially out tomorrow here in the States. Um, get a copy from your local independent bookstore if you can. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Paul and Kelly. What a team of moderators. We're very <laughs> blessed to have two of you um, tonight. No, thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, I admire your work and I, I think you're good people. Thank you, Megan, for being so late there and uh, to mm. being with me in this journey. And she's absolutely the less, um, she's very precise. She's the best. She's the best. And uh, she's the best translator you can have, really. And I, I'm saying it not because she's here, but because she's <laughs> very, no, because she's very like, she, gives you like the right you know amount of questions that don't make you crazy and i try to answer very fast and uh and i also think that it's her work i'm not very um you know 
I, I know many writers read it and get a lot into the details, but I trust her mm. and I like what she does. But anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, so, I'm sorry we can't answer any, all of it, but it's kind of a lot. And uh, I hope you, you know, you like the book too, as they do. Oh, they will. They better. <laughs> <laughs> they will. They will. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Good, night. good night. Congratulations. Yeah, congrats. So much.